moment where that clicked for you and sort of served as an entry. And I'm also curious because uh, when you talk about sort of your work being collected, is your performance work collected or is it object-based work collected? What is the relation between? I never mentioned collected. Oh, well, in your bio it talks about like your, your work is in the oh, collections video. of. Oh, videos or videos. photos or. Okay, or so, so, so the performance work is not collected per se. Well, I, I, I'm in the videos, so I perform in the videos. So okay. I, I don't distinguish between, I, I mean, my live performances, no. Right. But the art world for the last number of years has figured out how to commodify those anyway, so. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to unpack I'm that a little. What, you're waiting? I'm waiting, waiting yeah. Okay, great. Because, yeah, like, you know, that's, that's something that very much interests me and we'll have to see how that unfolds, uh, collecting ephemeral performance. Um, so can you, okay. Talk, can you just talk a little bit? I'm like, stand up to me is fascinating because of like the very rigid structure and the very, like, it's actually a very difficult performative discipline that gets undervalued because there's so much bad comedy out right. there. Well, so I, I don't know how good I was and I don't know if I ever <laughs> did it. I, I mean, I, I worked with this guy who was my manager for a while and he, I mean, he told me I never had five minutes. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, discovered comedy. I mean, television when I was a kid and a lot of the, I mean, television had a lot of uh, the Ed Sullivan show. You get people that had do five minutes. Right. And then back then they didn't have the internet so people could travel for a couple of years with those five minutes and do that act over and over again. Um, at the time it was, I had a lot of time on my hands when I went to this, the club, the stand-up mm -hmm. club and it was also, it was kind of interesting because it was not the setup or the situation was not that foreign from what it was in um, the gallery situation. You had a lone performer standing up there and you had an audience and there was like trying to get some sort of reaction. A lot of times it'd be playing off the moment, even though a lot of it was rehearsed and staged and a lot of, or scripted, and, a, and then a lot of it was like at the moment. Um, so I, I don't know if I quite understood that then, but it also sounded kind of interesting because the tenor of the art world was very serious. So it sounded kind of, you know, it made for interesting conversation at a cocktail party. What do you do? Oh, I'm a comic. It was bullshit, but it sounded good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so Wura, um, I wanted to ask, um, I, unfortunately I haven't seen your work, so it's a little naive. But um, you say that a lot of it, you, you started in photography in that world and then sort of found that the body was very important. Um, I'm just curious, what... Uh, I'm trying to figure out. How does the body, like, tell me a little bit about that and do you, have you done subsequently do you need to do training to, for your body to do what you need it to do performatively, or? Well, I guess yes and no. I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty athletic person, but if you're, are you asking about artistic training? Yeah, like have you done <laughs> choreography or like movement training or anything um, like that? I haven't until uh, pretty recently. I, I did some viewpoints training, which is the Anne Bogart's um, theater um, exercises paradigm. Uh, so, so in terms of, uh, you know, that, that's my main, I mean, that's kind of the only formal theater training I have, if you can call it that. Um, and other than that, I mean, my, my relationship to the physical, my own physicality has been the way I've uh, been, in, been connected to performance. Though I would say that I, I, I think for many creative people, the body is really, and the sensual is at the root of how we make things. So it doesn't necessarily happen, always happen in front of an audience, but there's something, you know, visceral about most parts of the process. Um, though I suppose you could argue that sitting in front of the computer isn't very visceral. Um, I think most art forms, you know, have that kind of engagement to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, I, I'm just, I'm trying to un, un, unpack it a little because one of the, you know, uh, interesting things that that I think is is happening at the moment is 
uh, as artists move between disciplines or across disciplines is that is this sort of idea of like what skills are required in different media you right know? I know and you you wrote about that and and um, and I wonder you know you have this you have this question about how like dancers, choreographers, uh, people in the theater are, have gone through this rigorous training. And so for the visual artist who hasn't had that same, well, theoretically, that same physical training, they're somehow not um, kind of prepared or maybe they don't have the discipline for the, they can just do performance art and they don't have kind of the, the, um, the integrity, right, to do it. That's what you suggested in your article. It's okay. A little bit less, but a little, uh, not so much. But but I but I but I'm but I'm curious about what it means like to you when you're putting your own body out there as part of the art process, you know, in a very just like what's the difference between sort of one and the other? Between uh, this mic situation is very frustrating for me. Okay, between um, maybe I can just take it off of here. Can I? All right. Um, between performing and visual art, or no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying. Uh, uh, my question is, is um, yeah, I'm, you're right. Like what I wrote in my essay is like, it's like I, I want, I wonder about that. Like you know, people whose train artists whose training is body based, um, what their what their presence is in front uh, and engagement, what that dynamic is versus an artist who is primarily visual based and then using their body as a canvas, if you will, or, or a locus for aesthetic engagement. Right. Um, you know, to, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, qu that that binary can exist, but I think the question is more, for me anyway, the way I think about it is more about um, presence, you know? And, and there's something about you know, someone who, who hasn't, has no experience drawing, that the way they come to the paper is, um, can be really amazing if they, if they are present and observing. And I think that that happens, you know, with inexperienced performers in the way of performance art as well. You know, there, there are different ways we um, embody ideas or feelings or, you know, whatever. And, and I don't know if it's necessarily the discipline that determines the virtuosity. Okay, great. Um, Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, well, Laura raised some great things about sort of presence, and your piece currently deals with presence very much because you have the, uh, the physical actor and then you have the virtual uh, uh, Captain Kirk. Uh, yeah, Captain Kirk. And then um, also other pieces I've seen of yours definitely deal with sort of people as sort of, you know, uh, well, sit, stand, walk, lie down, definitely had presence in a totally different, and in that you worked with a bunch of people with a variety of different skill levels in terms of physical uh, embodiment. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, I think uh, the issue, well, presence has been uh, at the center of my work uh, um, since I began working on it. Um, but I have found that uh, it takes a tremendous amount of work to uh, 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 to empty the container, so to speak. Um, that it is not, I, I find that there is a something that an amateur, and I'll, I'll just, I, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean that in a person who has little to no experience as the people um, in sit, stand, walk, lie down. Many of them were rank amateurs and had never done any performing whatsoever. Um, when they first encounter um, something new, uh, uh, some exercises I might be doing, there is a spark. And that spark, by accident, can create some uh, pre present uh, fire but it is very short-lived. And so the uh, practice of uh, presence has become uh, something quite um, 
compelling to me and difficult. Not that I know what it is, but I find I'm practicing it all the time. Um, sort of uh, to how the, uh, uh, I, I, I think I would call it a consciousness about it. And I think um, the practice of uh, making w the work that I make is of developing a consciousness about the act of doing what you're doing, which leads to some sort of presence. Um, so the, uh, uh, I discovered in Sit, Stand, Walk, Lie Down that there was uh, a, a moat uh, on this island. And people had walked by the moat, I had walked by the moat a million times. But to somehow uh, notice the presence of that moat became um, uh, something interesting to me. And the moat took on the quality of a line seen sideways, very painterly thing. And by calling, I could call attention to that moat, its moatness, by uh, the placement or taking away of hands. And uh, since you didn't know where the hands would appear or disappear, uh, the moat became very interesting. So the performance became a way of pointing at the presence of the physical uh, uh, properties uh, of the architecture. And I think my directing skills also led to uh, it knowing that the, the presence of the hands became part of that dance, but n not the central part of that dance, if that makes any sense. You know, I think directing is about figuring out what things go in front of what things when. So, um, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. I'm, I'm sort of talking about my practice a little, and this, these are the things I engage with uh, uh, obsessively, um, and whether I get paid or not. <laughs> no, I think, no, I think it's, I mean, I actually think there's a wonderful consonance between what the artists are saying, because I think we're, everyone, everyone is talking that there is a visual element to sort of creating a visual environment and, and or a visual experience. Uh, this question of presence, it, you know, I think it's, it's not a valued of judgment. I think for me, it's sort of, and I think for the field in general, it's sort of how do we develop a framework that talks about the different modes of performance in these different contexts that isn't that honors the different practices that lead to what happens in that ephemeral moment. And I want to talk to Hillary, is it okay? I want to talk to Hillary a little bit about how did you like come to cu curate primarily performance art and sort of what do you, wh you know, what have you seen over the past, I guess, 10 years that you've been curating and or however yeah, it hasn't been that five long, years but, <laughs> but talk a little bit about what you know sure. um, yeah um, I was really lucky to um, work at the box gallery in Los Angeles that is the owner and is Mar McCarthy who is Paul McCarthy's daughter and so um, it was a good place to be and um, so the, the premise of the gallery when they started it was that there would be, they would show artists that, um, mainly performance artists and older who had been around who didn't really get their dues. And usually it was because their work was very sexual, political, they intentionally took themselves out of the art world because they didn't want to be in it. Um, so I was lucky to work with um, people like Barbara T. Smith, Simone Forti, um, people also with estates like Stan Vanderbeek and others. Um, so that's sort of how I got my start. And it was also being in Los Angeles, I was a, they, the, a lot of the artists that were still living we, I mean, we would interact with all the time, and um, and so that's where my interest was struck. Also, I have an arts background. I went to Cal Arts for studio art, and so I've always had an interest in performance work um, because it's harder to commodify, even though we do. <laughs> so, 
great. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think all of us at this table, um, you know, Michael talked about it, you just mentioned it, uh, you know, is, and this is, this is, if, you know, almost like an entire other discussion, which is that, you know, theater performance has not done a very good job, especially in the new, new era of commodi commodifying itself mm -hmm. and dance even less so. Uh, you know, I think, you know, at one point, you know, you would go see a play and then you could, the author could sell the script and so you could have some sort of, there would be an object that was sort of referencing what happened on the stage and someone could make some money that way. Yeah. That sort of gone away now because people don't make that kind of work so much and not so many, you know, and that's as an income thing. Um, see that on the streets all the time. They're selling scripts all the time. It's where? A, it's a cottage industry in New York. Oh, yeah, yeah, like those. So, are, yeah, 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 yeah. Someone's figured it out. Yeah. But um, it's interesting, I mean, you're like, it's like Tino Seagal, I guess, you know, gets paid a lot of money to sell, I don't know, whispered instructions, which is sort of amazing and brilliant. Um, I don't know, I, Michael just scoffs. I didn't scoff. Oh, okay. I just raised my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting moment, I think. Um, so actually, I, hi. Uh, I feel like we've been having a very nice conversation up here. Can you guys have questions, uh, thoughts? Uh, yeah, Wayne. Can you, can you, um, yeah, come, come, come to the, yeah. So, so for those of you who can't hear, and for those of you watching on the internet, hi, Wayne Ashley wanted to was asking, have, have we foregrounded this conversation in a discussion about sort of the market and capitalism and and consumption? I think there's various factors that lead to that. In terms yeah. of museums doing it, I think a lot of it has to do with funding. Some of it has to do with funding, education programs, bringing in a public, trying to attract them. So you have live events, you bring people in, you bring ticket holders. You can get funding from that. I also think it has to do with the economy and reaction to the economy in terms of artists and crit criticism. Also, these things are circular and they're cyclical. So these things come up over and over again. It's every four years or three years, there's a, there's a lifespan to these issues. So, and then I, in terms of like the people that are bringing these, um, I, I don't want to, I mean, not to get, not getting personal or anything, I just know that there's certain opportunities that are, are uh, attracting. And when you're dealing with spectacle, which a lot of the performance is, which a lot of happens at Performa, you're gonna get attention. And attention doesn't necessarily you know, lead to direct money, but it leads to influence. It's important. Yeah, I think um, to, uh, uh, to Wayne, to, to address the sort of foreground, yes, there, this whole chain of conversation started from uh, an essay, uh, a, a series of essays, one that I wrote, one that Claire Bishop wrote, um, and a bunch of stuff that came out of Performa where it was really, where we're, re and I think that that's what we're trying to do over the next 
you know, ongoing is unpack these issues around commodification. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I agree, like, I'm, 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 you know, it's like the, it's the Whitney is building a performance venue in their new museum, you know, MoMA, it, like, all these people are investing in something that I would imagine knowing the, the, that world may be out of fashion in six years. And I wonder what with these institutions are like, are they, mo and this is why the commodification is so interesting, or the collecting is so interesting, because it's like they wouldn't be, I wouldn't think that a major institution would invest in building a performing program, a performance program, unless they had a strategy for collecting the performance and creating value. Right. Or else to bring attention to it, that they're doing it. Who knows right. what that facility is going to look like and how practical or how good it's going to be. Right. But right. you well, can gather a lot of, you know, generate a lot of interest and excitement around it. And it, well, it Let's might, see it, how it sounds when you go in the room, if you can actually understand what's being said in a video. Yeah. Who knows? That, well, that's a big, that's a big, and I actually want to talk to Phil about this a little because, and this kind of gets to this, like, skill issue a little bit, is that I, um, you know, I know that you went to TCG to build this piece with Jim Finley. Um, just so, uh, and you can talk a little bit about that, but it's about sort of, are the places building with the equipment to make the work that they're asking to make? You know, if you're gonna ask Sarah Mitchelson to create a dance piece, is the Whitney building a facility that's gonna allow her to actually build, you know, what she's, or Richard Maxwell, who was in the biennial, you know, are, are, are we creating a, or are we creating a structure where the performing arts dedicated venues will continue to be underfunded, will serve as a sort of farm, you know, a petri dish to develop these artists that will then, you know, move to the MoMA and get acclaim for MoMA and not down the, I'm sorry. No, no, that's, okay, anyway, so if you want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I did spend uh, upwards of two years at uh, the Center Theater Group. Um, these are very interesting questions you ask, and I feel that uh, I, I, I will address uh, them through my own experience. It's probably the, the, the best way to do it. So um, uh, I, I did spend two years in a collaboration with Jim Finley at the Center Theater Group in Los Angeles, which arguably is the flagship regional theater in the country. Buildings this, that would dwarf this room. Um, and I found the experience was locked in uh, to certain preconceptions about how to build, how to construct a piece that uh, adversely uh, affected the creative process that Jim Finley and I were trying to engage in. Now, um, it, you know, we're not powerful guys, although I wouldn't mess with Jim. He's a big guy and, you know, beat the crap out of you. But, um, uh, uh, so, so uh, saying that, w you know, uh, we're two irate personalities, we can't be written off that way. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. The first a uh, hurdle I had to jump was with uh, playwriting. We were funneled within the institution into uh, new play development. Uh, the focus of the piece that we were building involved no written text, no play. Uh, you would think the conversation would end there, and we, what are you working on, and let's go to it, but uh, it didn't. And it became the subject of a year's, year's worth of arguing to uh, uh, make the people at the Center Theater Group understand we weren't dealing with a play, we were dealing with the experience of a performance. So I, I come at theater from, um, um, all the questions that you might ask about a play, meaning the play as a map for who are the characters, what's happening, what is the narrative, what is the set, but my solutions, well, I should say that each of those, each of those areas became the subject of questions for me, which I then built a production around over many, many years. So, um, uh, 
when I came to the Center Theater Group, I was not in a position to, when I said uh, I'm not going to work with a play, uh, it wasn't uh, to be a cool kid on the block. It was after years of work and research. I'm upset about that. So uh, I, I, I found that the institution could not, it became a binary situation, to uh, quote uh, myself. Uh, <laughs> um, that the institution could not handle the fact that we didn't have a play to work with. Part one. Part two was that Jim Finley is known primarily as a video designer. Um, Jim and I met and talked and our, our, we wanted to work with a very interesting question. What can we do with video that hasn't been done before? That's a really interesting question and a, maybe an impossible one and a really difficult one. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, Jim and I decided, well, let us start by, we will light the entire space only with video light. There will be no stage lighting, only video light. Great, let's start there, let's start work. Let's see how plastic is attracted to uh, video light and all that. Enter the center theater group, video, becomes, uh, within the institution, becomes a, a very problematic issue because you cannot videotape any actors who might enter uh, into the video frame while you're making something because then you have to negotiate a contract with, uh, I think, SAG or AFTRA to uh, clear it to okay it, so we had to go through this probably nine month, year long dance. Contracts had to be signed uh, uh, in order to use video to do anything in the room. So uh, it, the creative uh, energy went into uh, bureaucratic nonsense in my opinion, as opposed to um, uh, uh, the harder question of what can you do with this? I don't know. <coughs> so I found that uh, uh, the theater establishment uh, uh, became an uphill battle all the way. Um, I'm, I'm not unfamiliar with those battles and I don't think they're uh, unexpected or um, uh, I don't know what the word is, it's hot. Um, but they're very familiar and either you take them on or you don't. Uh, but I think much too much energy gets wasted inside the theater establishment trying to make something exactly like the thing that was already made. Instead of, there doesn't seem to be uh, a, a will inside of large institutions to do something that they don't know about. And my interest is purely in doing something that you don't know about when you start. And you keep your fingers crossed and you have faith that when you finish, uh, you will uh, make something that will be of interest. Um, I think, uh, were there another question? Uh, okay. Um, We're kind of getting up on it. Does anyone closing remarks, thoughts to share? Well, I'll just say one, um, one last thing. You know, you, we started this part of the conversation with a question about commodification. And I think that um, the example that you just spoke about is a really um, good point about how, about the, I don't know if I could call it the commodification of theater, but the reason that process exists is because for a long time people fought for unions and to do things in particular ways so that all of those collaborators in the process could get paid, right? right? And it's the same thing that happens in museums. There's a similar bureaucracy, so it's not, I don't think that it's, um, it's necessarily that the visual artists, you know, can sell the painting and make money and that the theater person can't, you know, we're, and when we're talking about the Whitney, we're talking about these number of artists. We're right. not talking about all of these people who are doing lots of different kinds of work to, uh, you know, to survive. So yeah. it's, I, I, yeah. 
And I think also, and then I'll give you this, <laughs> that the Whitney building a performance space um, along with the economic um, decisions that go behind that might also be a great sign of um, genre crossing and breaking down that is really necessary and that has, I think, always been um, the experience of artists that, you know, we, we are asked to study, study in a certain way, but there's a, you know, we're whole, we do lots of things, you know, we listen to sound, we feel the earth beneath our feet, we draw, even if I'm a theater artist, so um, it, I think it's a good thing as well. Um, I just want to add that the Whitney was actually modeled after a series at the, at the Whitney that happened 30, 40 right. years ago. Uh, and uh, the curators are well aware of it, and it's also c was seen as a swan song to that building, to, to you know, sort of inhabit that building for a while. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was... Uh, also, in terms of, like, you know, um, organizing or unions, I mean, a lot of the... the it's not about... Um, the discussion's not about money sometimes. It is about money, but in terms of collaboration, it's about credit. You know, mm -hmm. in term it, with artists too, and that that becomes a, a, a talking point with them, or a, a, a big part of it. Um, but they do have unions too. There's been unions in the trying to organize artists in terms of uh, getting together. It's not yeah. only in that world, but it's less. It's not as powerful. Yeah. Well, I think I thank thank you. I mean, I think I wish we had like another hour. <laughs> Um, just because this is this is sort of I think that uh, Laura, what you're talking about is I think exa is exactly sort of like I'm looking at everyone here and looking at the program for this festival. And I'm like I'm seeing all these artists that are you know artists like fundamentally whether their primary in mode of engagement is choreography or quote unquote theater or visual or whatever. And I mean, and that's probably and that's always I think the way it's been to some extent. But I think now more than ever. And, and that's always a horrible thing to say, but it feels like this moment embraces a multitude of creative expressions by self-identified artists. And what I'm hearing from Philip and what I'm hearing also is that, is that are the institutions, A, are the institutions sort of developing mm -hmm. uh, curatorial and production models that suit that mode of creativity? Um, and, um, you know, and and the issues you address around sort of labor and, and, and equity and getting paid for your work, I think are a huge issue regardless of discipline right now. Um, but when we did this in January, you know, it was interesting, like I sort of feel like, you know, the, the, the sort of Lort theater model and the sort of like, you know, I think that the art, art is, feels old. Um, and I think that, you know, the Contemporary Art Center I idea seems to be more relevant to this moment. But, um, I, you know, where you have, like, you know, a performance program and a visual art program, and it's all housed in one thing, and, you know, but even in those institutions, um, you know, I was talking to someone from a major contemporary art center who said, you know, that, you know, um, even internally they have communications issues between the people that curate performance and the people that curate the visual arts world, and some of it's, some of it's like just logistics, it's like the prep time for an exhibit at, a mu at the museum is like two years and the prep time for a performance is like, you know, six months, nine months. So you have these, so, uh, but I, but um, anyway, um, do you want to talk a little bit before we go, just tell us about the show, the artists that are here that we can come see at the gallery. Um, so tonight we're having two performances by uh, Math Bass and Dashiell Manley, who are, if you just want to wave, so. And then, um, and those will happen at seven o'clock tonight. And tomorrow, Barry McGregor Johnston, who's right there, um, will be performing here at um, seven. And they're all very wonderful. I could go on and on, but you should really just come and see the performances. Great. So I want to, um, uh, I want to thank all of the panelists. It's been a great discussion. Thank you guys for coming. Um, and continue it online. I, uh, uh, yeah. Send feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Ron.